Hello everyone, today we talk about the Serbian reform of the Roman army. So, theoretically, the first organizer and reformer of the Roman army was, according to the uh, Roman historiographical tradition, um, the, uh, the Roman king Servius Tullius, uh, the sixth king of Rome, as a matter of fact, and um, this is, we, we talk really about the Roman army proper from, from this time, because before, the Roman armed forces were actually um, the uh, retinues of the, um, of the Latin or Sabine or Etruscan nobility that made up uh, Rome. Uh, in practice, and this is the first, really, the first Roman army proper because it was organized not just from a strictly military and tribal, but from a political point of view, in the sense of the polis, m in the classical uh, meaning of the word. Um, so the um, this is we are still in in the um, in the midst uh, in the fogs of myth, let's say. Um, relatively to this phase of Roman history, you know that practically everything that happened before the 3rd century BC um, is something, even the 70s of the 3rd century BC is, is between, I mean, it's still historical in part, but in part it's just legend or myth about Roman history, and the, the actual Serbian reform as such might have not I mean, I believe it existed because from a strictly practical point of view that there had to be a point in, into which um, this democratic system of recruitment had to be uh, instituted in some form. But it, it might have been probably also something very progressive, something that didn't really occur uh, from a day to another, um, and that probably also uh, implied very strong uh, clashes between the um, within Roman society itself at the time, um, chiefly for the fact that the transition from a um, tribal world into which basically the, the, mm, the, the political and military decisions are taken by um, on the basis of the relationships of the various clans practically so privately it shifted to something that was more public because the Serbian reform wasn't just a military reform but also a political and juridical one as um, the uh, sensual democratic base and, uh, uh, and criterion on which it was based, let's say, um, was uh, in it implied that there had to be um, new uh, voting assemblies that corresponded in to this sense to a citizenship, to um, the idea that, that definitely Rome at that point, or, or whatever it was, because even the foundation of Rome, you know, it's very hotly disputed at that point, uh, when and how it, it, it practically occurred at this time. Um, but it, it implied that uh, this community, however, had grown so much uh, at uh, that point that it was necessary to uh, basically vote um, as a people um, in political terms to achieve uh, a common a decision, a common mm, consensus and taking a common direction, which uh, mm, was extremely important at the times, uh, especially because Rome, uh, or the Roman communities were already fighting pretty intensely with their neighbors, so this idea of the metus hostilis, so the, the fear of the enemy that brings societies to, 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 to grow more cohesive, more um, more structured and organized, even from a political point of view, um, and and we don't have to think that with the Serbian reform, eventually Rome became this sort of city-state, uh, like uh, you know <laughs> a 19th century um, national uh, state, into which uh, there was a strong centralized authority that nobody could contest, basically. Um, there was still the persistence for actually for many centuries of a an aristocratic uh, primacy that however was slowly beginning to decline um, Rome was always an, an oligarchy it was never a, a democracy in practice um, the um, the nobles were always the ones that in a way or in another managed to um, to rule Rome 
However, the people was growing as um, the lower classes were growing um, considerably, also for, and especially from an economical point of view. Hence, why the Serbian reform is so um, indicative of this, because it shows that that the criterion in which the the um, the um, let's say the citizens could participate to uh, the uh, the army was based on their personal uh, wealth and their personal revenues um, and therefore the uh, aristocratic primacy was mm, was being challenged in practice but at the same time these lower strata of the populations were increasingly um, um, uh, participating to the res publica, hence to this public um, being, to this public matter that uh, evidently um, couldn't contemplate the, um, the the opposition to aristocracy, but if anything, a sort of of blending together for for a common mm, for for common achievements, so the um, and and we know a very few about this because uh, as I was saying the mm, from a historiographical point of view we don't really know much. The, the Serbian reform was described chiefly in the Augustan age by Levi and Dionysius of Alicarnaxus. Um, that, by the way, were uh, relying also on the information um, de um, derived from um, from the third century older Fabius uh, Picter and other analysts, uh, about whom we don't know m really much, uh, whose um, um, sources have largely not survived. So we're really mm, Basing ourselves on, on information wasn't really just um, already scanty at that time, that but which was readapted in the Augustan age on the base of other ideals um, and political and military models that had been developed actually much later um, uh, compared to, to Serbian times. Um, and that in this sense do not have to be taken literally. Basically the Romans in the Augustan age were depicting this um, medical past on the base of a sort of a republican um, ideal for which um, uh, it was very democratic in form in the sense that you know the idea of the free um, Roman citizen, peasant soldier that actively participated for the good of his um, uh, fatherland to 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 the army and all. I mean, this was always very, um, and in particular in Serbian times, it was really very uh, idealistic. Even the, the the idea of the peasant soldier is or the citizen soldier is kind of a relative. Um, even in the moments of major glory of the Roman army and you know, of the functionality of the uh, Republican institutions. However, um, this is just um, to be aware that um, not everything that we read is definitely what what, what really happened. Um, and um, basically, according to tradition, Servius Tullius, that was um, um, an Etruscan king. However, um, he might have been really also a Latin. Um, he might have had actually um, um, Latin origins. Um, this idea that Rome was a, an Etruscan city is um, it, it's something that we have to not to stress too much because definitely the mm, the political uh, in, in the Roman political institutions were drawn partly from the Etruscans, but Rome already at this time was actually uh, very different from the Etruscan cities and. Um, it had a very different um, uh, background. Reason for which, uh, and and why why the Ser the Serbian reform is so um, uh, um, unique because um, um, this uh, new constitution didn't belong to the it wasn't known actually to the Etruscan cities. The Romans were born with a democratic idea that was completely unknown to um, uh, Etruscan society. Because the Etruscan society kept maintaining the uh, aristocratic primacy, 
So there was not a, um, a sensual um, segmentation, certification of society for which, uh, you know, the, the, the commoner could participate to the army equally to the uh, wealthier guys at the top. Absolutely not. Etruscan society remained, till the very end, um, a very stronger, uh, strongly ar aristocratically dominated society and it never achieved the, li the level of egalitarianism that existed into Rome from a political and social point of view. And this might be tied to actually to many reasons because the Latins were Indo-Europeans, about the Etruscans we really don't know. Um, it also depends probably on the, uh, the same dynamics of development of Rome that was definitely the largest city at, at this time. I mean, I don't think that, um, well, it had yet to grow, so probably some of the Etruscan polis were, were, were more structured and all, but Rome rose pretty fast to be I into a very large um, um, in, into a, a very large urban center that in this sense couldn't hold more than much the absolute and undisputed um, uh, um, nobiliar rule um, into, into this group of, 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 of freemen substantially. So I, it is really something very different and Rome uh, far from being a copy of, of something else, because this is a actually also the narrative that you hear around, that the Romans grew um, by copying others. This is not really true. I mean, most of these copies were really superficial, and the more you scratch, the more you realize that the Romans actually had something very unique in there. Uh, I mean, this is not really for exalting the Romans as such, I'm pretty neutral to the thing, but uh, it's really to to understand that the reasons of of the the, the uh, Ro of the Roman success lays really in very peculiar characteristics of Rome proper that weren't known to any other people or political organization at the time. So uh, going back to the reform, Servetulius um, um, allegedly um, uh, enacted this reform to um, blend. Um, more uh, proficiently all the various ethnicities that existed into the city. Rome, as we were saying before, it was mainly Latin city, but there were also a lot of Sab Sabines f since the very origins of Rome. Um, um, there were also another Indo-European people, and, and there were probably also people coming from uh, all around, and, and chiefly there was also this strong, especially cultural, um, Etruscan influence that definitely contributed into in, in to the shaping of the Roman institutions, um, and uh, the mm, the idea of Servius Tullius was to amalgamate the um, um, the, the the Roman society basically um, beyond the um, the ancient tribal uh, repartitions. And by sub, mm, subdividing um, the population into five classes, they were based simply on the uh, on the individual wealth. Mm. Um, so this was very important because it is the passage that uh, we were mentioning before, the, the passage from from a tribal base of recruitment that was essentially a private business to uh, a democratic one, uh, hence. Um, based on the um, per uh, on, on the individual's uh, revenue, uh, and therefore something that could be exacted uh, by a state. So uh, this is the moment in which the uh, the city proper, the orbs, the polis was um, was being formed um, as um, um, a superior. Uh, um, force uh, as a central government, as a central authority that could, in, in case, punish those who, for instance, didn't want to participate to the army. Um, and also in here, obviously, as I was saying at the beginning of the video, you don't have to think that there was anything like a Roman police that arrived there from a centralized state and made things done. No, it was the same Romans, uh, in the same tribes, paradoxically, that decided that this had to be the new form of organization. Um, it was always a matter of mm, oligarchies in practice. And part of the tribal um, institutions definitely remained in Rome. 
Um, this reform, as you understand, was chiefly thought um, as um, the uh, for, for the participation to politics, so for voting rights and for the army. And the two things were very closely intertwined because if you didn't participate uh, to the defense of your city, you could uh, you had no right to vote, and we will see here now in a while. So. Um, how was really the um, individual wealth calculated? Well, um, the military service was required um, for those citizens that were uh, that owned uh, mm, land property, practically. That were so called. Uh, that were so. Uh, they were called the ad sidui, mm, uh, which uh, um, etymologically it's it, it's the same. Um, 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 term from, from which the, the world accidents uh, actually um, um, comes from. So the, the, the it stresses this idea of um, of um, of persistence, but also a um, in the per in this sense in the in the partici participation to the army. Um, which corresponds also to a certain mm, individual discipline and love for the um, the same mm, political and military uh, rights, uh, essentially. So th those were the guys who assiduously participated to um, to the army, um, and um, the. This um, uh, the Ed we were not, however, the entire uh, land-owning population, so a population of Rome, because um, the five classes instituted by Servius Tullius um, uh, were um, chosen on a le uh, from uh, a minimal uh, le level of uh, of revenue upwards. And it wasn't even a much low level. I mean, it was actually pretty high. There were lots of people who were left out, I even though they had some f some qu consistent quantity of of money. So this tells you, by the way, how this was mm, this this reform was still shifted towards mm, the top. Uh, how the the um, it, it was the political uh, military and the political rights and, and the participation for the army was something that still didn't comprehend the world population, but it was still at the top, like in the in the tribal past, um, in a certain measure. Even though it, it it definitely represented a very large extension compared to to previous uh, to previous standards. Um, and by the way, I, I, it's pretty normal because I, imagine that the nobles that still owned power in the city began to see there were lots of people who were growing substantially wealthy and that um, by tradition didn't participate to the army, or at least they weren't interested because maybe, I don't know, they were craftsmen of, or merchants and all. They started imposing to them um, on the base of their wealth, so the fact that they could uh, materially participate to the army, the uh, the military, the military service. So um, uh, it is interesting uh, in this sense. Um, also, the mm, the ethnical base of, of this um, recruitment, because um, also the non-Romans that um, uh, that lived on the um, that owned properties on the Roman uh, uh, land. Uh, and that had a, a domicilium, so a residence substantially into the Roman territory, were obliged to, to participate um, uh, to the army. Um, so this um, it is interesting, by the way, that um, as in many other um, practically almost of all the other historical context, um, this um, form of, of a new taxation that existed in practice. Um, it was created for the sake of, of creating um, an efficient armed force. Mm. Military expenses are uh, definitely the uh, the largest ones <laughs> in in any in, in any context in history, at least in, in terms of mm, uh, especially uh, relatively to to the time, because keeping an army that costs really a lot. So um, 
this uh, was definitely a um, also a pretty clear uh, clear indicator of the rising force of the Roman society as a whole. I mean, these guys were able to impose to themselves a participation to the army because they 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 understood that their their force their strength was um, was great enough even to 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 be necessary in order to for the city to expand and. The, uh, the attrition of of other of the uh, of the neighbors of the surrounding neighbors. Um, at this time, Rome is still dwelling into a Latin um, range, let's <laughs> say, uh, dimension. Um, um, it's it's still not expanding further into Italy. There were other Latin cities that weren't really the same thing as Rome. Rome was the biggest one in into Latium practically, but there were other communities all around that already had mm, some kind of social military development and, and definitely this um, reform was tied also to the competition that existed between the, the, the Latins uh, themselves. And, uh, the, um, and as I was saying before, um, uh, this was this reform was very revolutionary uh, into uh, the into Italy in the sense of the Italic uh, context because um, no other people in Italy was uh, doing anything like that. I mean, the cities did not exist if not um, for for the Greek colonies that, however, were mainly scattered in in the south of the peninsula and were mainly mm, interested in 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 sea trade. Uh, the Italic mm, peoples of the mainland w were something completely different. They were mm, tribal peoples, just like the Celts or the uh, or, or the Iberians. Uh, and, and they didn't know even the, the, the political institution in the sense of, of the polis of the city-state. Um, so what, were, what Rome was doing in this sense was uh, very um, different from what was happening uh, elsewhere among the Italic peoples. Um, it was probably inspired mm, to the Etruscans who weren't Italic. They were part of the Italian peoples in the sense that they dwelt into the Italian peninsula, geographically speaking, but um, we, we do not know whether we were Indo-Europeans or not, and they seemingly had, uh, however, a very different um, identity and, mm, and, and culture from the, the Italics. Um, but uh, Rome went even beyond this, and, and this is probably the, um, the, the, the main explanation. I mean, the Romans were taking essentially one one in the shaping of their new institutions a bit from the italics and a bit from the etruscans from the italics they were taking the fact that as italics themselves um they felt to be um freemen mm, like all the indo-european tribesmen and and basically claiming that yeah there were um definitely formally uh, not formally but practically aristocracies, because aristocracies were present everywhere into the Indo-European society. But theoretically, this aristocratic preeminence derived from certain contingent factors that evidently were the fact that aristocrats had accumulated power and that they could use it in political and military terms, but th that theoretically the Roman um, citizenry, in this sense, was based purely on the um, uh, equality on the in theoretical individual equality of all the uh, Roman um, citizens, as long as they were citizens. And the participation to the army, also here, a very warlike aspect, in typical of an Indo-European society, was part of this right. It um, w was really the, the right into which these um, prerogatives uh, were incarnated. Um, but differently from the Italics, they, they, they adopted from the Etruscans instead this political organization. I mean, the idea that in spite of the uh, freedom of the local mm, population, there was still a superior institution um, that was the one of the polis. That, however, very differently from the Etruscans, wa wasn't, gr uh, wasn't uh, a purely um, aristocratic-ruled thing. 
and into which the military service in this sense was a prerogative of all the citizens, not just of the nobility, like it was for the Etruscans. Because the Etruscan nobility dis heavily despised all the other um, all the other mm, um, uh, connationals. The, the, you know, the, the rest of the commoners and the peasantry was basically subjugated to the aristocracy. So they did, um, and it d there was no mm, strong middle class that could form a, a political military bulk of um, an egalitarian mm, society and political organization at all. Um, uh, it was all these noble houses that ruled over uh, a huge amount of peasantry. The Romans in this sense were extremely different and they had a very strong middle class of freemen, of warriors, of of peasants that could provide uh, basically the, the bulk of the army and and having their own um, their own saying into the political and military uh, matters of, of the community. Um, so Dionysius for Amenconaxus from the Roman Antiquities 4.16 uh, 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 makes Servius Tullius say uh, I establish to um, basically evaluate all the, uh, the goods and, and properties and to um, to tax each one according to this um, axiomate and because I believe uh, to be com convenient and advantageous for the community that who that those who possess much give much and those who possess a few give few. So this is still a um, this existed already in into uh, into other um, populations in the world but definitely it's still at the base of our western mm, our western idea. I mean it's pretty Human societies usually, uh, when they they reach a certain level of development, used to to act and to reason into this sense. But it's still very important that eventually this was at the base of um, proportional taxation, <laughs> let's say, and uh, uh, um, which which is something that still exists today. Excuse me, uh, I drink a little. So this uh, the Serbian reform <laughs> um, implied a very strict relation between the uh, revenue, uh, the military duties, and civil uh, and civil rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, it introduced the principle according to which who had more interests had also the um, the uh, the the greater duty to contribute to the defense of the state and according to Levy 142-43 and substantially confirmed also by Dionysius um, every class of the five that had been established um, uh, um, with the exception of the patrician nobility was divided into groups that were called um, uh, centuries, the Kenturiae, mm, that had uh, that were eventually 193 in total. Mm. This gives you also the the theoretical dimension of of Rome as um, as a demographic community in practice, because every which of these centuries had. Um, um, basically uh, the right to one vote uh, to the um, citizen assembly the um, there was s called the comitia centuriata so the the um, the um, centuriated assemblies or comitia I, I don't know how you say that in English um, so uh, you understand that it wasn't really based on the um single number of people who existed in there but to their um um wealth practically because um the the numerical consistency of of, of the people who were part of these centuries wasn't equal for all the classes uh but all of them were uh, obliged to provide uh 100 men for the uh, uh levy so uh, basically the, um, the centuries of the wealthier classes were less 
in number um, and, and they also had um, less people in them so they're um, I mean the fact that there were less in number doesn't matter th what it, what matters is that there were less people in it so their their own commitment for war their contribution for the military expenses was higher in proportion um, uh, because the the single individual was wealthier and could participate with with more uh, goods um, but uh, in turn this also meant that being fewer um, they had a, a, a greater political capacity because their vote uh, as a century was equal to the one of other centuries that instead were composed by a larger number of, of people. So basically the wealthier guys uh, had a greater um, voting uh, capacity than the others. And uh, However, as we said, uh, in turn they had to contribute more individually. So this is a very um, logical concept. I don't know how properly I'm explaining it, but kind of uh, it's pretty um, it's pretty um, kind of um, obvious in in the way it works, and definitely pretty logical. Um, the um, so the the five let's talk about the five classes at this point. And uh, here in background picture, I s um, made a little synthesis of how the, the whole thing worked in terms of uh, the the levels of census uh, of the single classes and um, how many uh, um, and how the, the actual contribution had to be. Now we will be seeing it in detail. So the first class mm, there was also simply called classes so let's say the class pro, pro excellence uh, was made up of the wealthier uh, by the wealthier citizens, and um, and those were um, uh, uh, the one. Uh, th this was the one who had um, uh, a yearly uh, revenue of at least one hundred thousand asses. Mm -hmm. Was pretty uh, definitely pretty high, and it was in turn subdivided in eighty centuries. 40 of juniores that, um, uh, and 40 of seniores. This differentiation um, basically was on the base of, uh, uh, um, on an anagraphic base, mm, because the, the 40 um, uh, centuries of juniores were made up of the citizens that had an age comprehended between the 17 and 40 year, 46 um, uh, years. Um, of age and the uh, the, the uh, forty seniores centuries were instead made up of the citizens uh, whose age was comprehended between forty seven and the sixty years old. So the um, the um, the juniores were um, were actually destined to the external military campaigns while the the seniors were kept in reserve for the defense of the city so here um, you understand that there was a pretty evident reason for which uh, the younger and, and and therefore on average stronger um, men were sent to um, to fight um, in, in outside the city practically when we say abroad w uh, here the Romans didn't really venture themselves <laughs> very far uh, at this time but it was still a, a, a considerably physical um, a considerable force from a from a material economical and definitely also physical point of view and that's the reason why uh, these guys were sent out while the the older guys were kept at uh, in the city uh, of Rome, uh, for uh, for any evenience of uh, an emergency of of defense, um, the, um, the 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 defensive uh, um, uh, weapons uh, armaments, let's say, that were was prescribed in to the first class was very similar, um, although not the same really in Italy uh, to the one of the um, of the Greek hoplites in practice. Uh, um, 
he was made up by a helmet, a cuirass, um, um, greaves, um, and also a very large round shield, the so-called clipos in, in, in Latin. Um, while the offensive weapons were, were uh, a lance called hasta and a sword could be either iron or, or bronze. Um, this kind of equipment was definitely the most expensive, as we, we as you understand, um, uh, on the base of this social segmentation, democratic segmentation. Um, and um, I said that um, this kind of equipment was similar essentially to one of the uh, Hellenic hoplites. Um, but this doesn't really mean that the Romans fought as hoplites. This is really a topic that I'll have to discuss um, to dedicate uh, at least a, a, a video to because um, people get it wrong all the time. I mean, um, even certain s in uh, Roman history manuals claim this um, lie that the Romans had a perfect copy of the Hellenic phalanxes. This is completely false. The, uh, the classical oplitic phalanx is something that you find only and exclusively in Greece and not even into the Greek colonies elsewhere. Uh, many other people, uh, many peoples that interacted with the, um, with the Greeks definitely could afford a Greek a Greek uh, equipment because the Greeks ad uh, at this point had the most advanced military technology. Um, they were um, spreading culture. That they were a very advanced civilization. So it was normal for many peoples around the Mediterranean to get Hellenized in in terms of material culture. So to buy Greek artifacts, including uh, weapons and armors. Uh, and this is something you can find everywhere, into the Black Sea, as well as into southern Gaul, or into Spain, or in Africa. And, and, and it was kind of cool and fashionable to, 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 to dress up like uh, an Hellenic hoplite. I mean, we have a pretty extensive evidence, for instance, of, um, of Italic warriors, in the sense that used uh, uh, Hellenic styles um, uh, gear practically. The Etruscans um, that were pretty wealthy did definitely, af with their, especially their aristocrats uh, that we have seen before, uh, they, they could afford to, to buy Greek uh, weapons and armor. But having uh, those weapons absolutely doesn't equate in military historical terms to the fact that the, these populations fought like the uh, uh, I in an Hellenic style phalanx. Uh, all the peoples of the Mediterranean definitely had their um, um, thickly packed uh, infantry formations. Cavalry wasn't, um, you know, very developed in Europe at this time. Um, and every um, so that even the, the the Greek sources state that I don't know the, even the Celts had a phalanx, but phalanx is a very generic term. It actually means um, um, it's as if uh, it's a tree. Um, there is a uh, wait a second. Um, phalanx essentially means uh, uh, it's as if it was. I can't find the term now, but a tree trunk that basically smashes everything along its way. That, that's a real meaning of the phalanx. But in, in concrete military terms, you know, organization of an army, the Romans didn't have an oplitic phalanx. Their fighting styles wa was much more, th their, form their formations were, uh, were much more, um, uh, were much less thickly compact than the Atlantic ones, simply because these were tribesmen. They weren't citizens yet. They were starting now, also thanks to the Serbian reform, to be citizens. But first of all, they were Italic warriors, and this means that they fought in a completely different fashion from Atlantic citizens that despised um, the mil uh, with the usual except of the Spartans that in this sense com do confirm the rule, that they despised war. I mean, they they see they saw that as a political necessity, but they didn't practice in 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 reality. 
At this time, the Romans were pretty much uh, still a very warlike and, and uh, people with a with a very high military, individual military, um, a very high individual military uh, quality. Let's say typical of the warriors that dwelled all over the uh, uh, European continent, um, and they fought in a completely different style. In single combat, they had a very uh, they didn't stay all together with the, like the Greek hoplites, um, just for like two uh, rugby uh, teams, like just trying to push uh, each other's formation until unt it, it it breaks, because that was just a particular Hellenic thing, created exactly to minimal uh, to minimize the uh, the individual effort. The Romans didn't care about this. The Romans at this time, if you take if you see their own equipments. You, you perfectly understand that their fighting style wasn't one of the politic um, of, of, of Hellenic hoplites. They were much more individually uh, uh, minded. They they were much more aggressive. They were they were much more specialized. They had javelins. They had I mean they were much more versatile. So here this military asset and the, the fact that that the uh, guys at the top had an Hellenic style equipment. Uh, it's just a superficial indicator uh, of a uh, the the material influence of the Hellenic world because of trade uh, exchanges and all. But the the core of society was something extremely different that did not fight in the fashion of the Oplitic phalanx. Do not stress this because there is no actual historical evidence of any kind that the Romans fought like Hellenic Oblites, nor did the Etruscans, nor did any other people whatsoever. So uh, do not make the, mis the mistake, I promise that I will make a video about this, because this, this is probably one of the most important things in the Roman military that un unex mm, unexplained, uh, let's say, unexplicably people completely ignore in popular culture, and that many historians also got, got it Got got really wrong practically. So um, to to the first class of of uh, the Serbian army were attached also two centuries of carpenters and and smiths. They were called fabri, as you see here, um, uh, and the um, to the and, and 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 these were didn't really uh, need to 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 take their own equip uh, to to provide uh, their own equipment um but they they simply were uh, uh asked to uh to build tra transport and to maneuver the uh, the siege um machinery essentially and any other military um uh, equipment practically the romans at this time didn't have siege machinery in terms of um catapults or stuff like that also because they didn't still uh, they didn't exist yet um but they were definitely uh, uh they were starting to to besiege our latin uh, or etruscan centers and therefore they 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 began to 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 build um certain siege machinery like i don't know uh wooden um uh, covers or um, areas or um or um uh, or ladders or stuff like that um that were m uh, for which the uh, the fabri uh, were required um in order to be built um <coughs> so uh, passing to the second class uh you see here their revenue was um Comprehended between the seventy-five thousand and the hundred uh, thousand asses, uh, it was instead subdivided into twenty centuries, uh, ten of juniores and ten of seniores, and the um, their equipment was actually pretty similar to the one of the first class, with the exception of the cures and of the clipos, um, that was instead substituted by the scutum that was. Um, a uh, more rectangular shaped uh, shield of italic origin which was simpler and, and definitely more economical than um, to use than the clipos that was actually made up in metal while this cotton was in, uh, made of wood 
Um, so uh, it was also uh, also the QRS was a considerable heavy and expensive gear. Um, the um, and this second class was definitely lighter and more um, more agile, definitely. The third class um, was revenue was comprehended between the fifty thousand and the seventy five thousand asses was um, subdivided in other twenty centuries, uh, and it pres um, and um, it, it prescribed an armament that was similar to the one of the second in turn. Um, 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 uh, aside from the um, the greaves, as you as you can see uh, even in the um, table that I that I wrote. So li relatively lighter. Uh, it's interesting here that the second and third class were weren't that different in equipment. So it tells you that probably these classes were um, relatively more numerous uh, and. Um, uh, as a wall, and the and and the uh, a consistent part of the Roman mm, uh, citizens uh, belonged uh, uh, to them, uh, to the relative cent cent centuries at least, um, and um, and and this is told also by the fact that you know wearing greaves or not is it's not this excessive thing. I mean the greave is is a pretty expensive um, uh, armor. Considering the uh, that it's normally made in in, in metal, so um, um, it definitely there is some difference. But conceptually speaking, from a tactical point of view, uh, th they were pretty much the same uh, the same kind of, of of fighters. Then the uh, the fourth class, whose revenue was comprehended between the twenty five thousand and the fifty. Um, thousand asses was made up by other twenty centuries, as you read, uh, and it obliged to be armed at least with a lance and a javelin, the verutum. Mm. Uh, here it's interesting that uh, the the javelin uh, doesn't appear in the uh, mm, between the, the first and third classes. Um, um, but presumably, considering what we know from archaeology and generally speaking from the uh, archaic Roman military, we can assume that the um, actually also the other classes were equipped with a javelin. Our information is pretty scanty, so there would there wouldn't be any uh, any strange thing about it. Uh, we know, as a matter of fact, that the Etruscan um, um, let's say hope light, always remembering that they they weren't really uh, like the Hellenic hope lights uh, in in in, uh, in in combat formation, uh, were actually armed with heavy javelins as well. So uh, this was actually typical of all the um, tribal peoples of Europe to fight with a lance that occasionally can become a, a javelin. Um, or just with a set of of javelins that in this sense you can use interchangeably uh, the hasta is um, is generally the the stopping spear you know the big spear similar to the one of of the Greek hoplite so it has a precise function but um, the Roman um, warrior at this time uh, had probably uh, javelins uh, as a regular um uh, weapon in his gear so um here the fourth class uh, being required just with an asta and a verutum was probably a lighter um skirmishing uh unit we probably it, it, it at this point it's consi it's um um tactical consistency would have made it a sort of skirmishing um class, uh, similar to the later Velites, essentially, um, but still able to definitely engage into hand-to-hand -hand combat, but being more flexible, more probably also scattered around or in front of the, um, of, uh, of the army in some measure, in, in some form. Then relatively to the fifth class, um, which uh, was uh, still made up of, of citizens, um, 
um, and those um, Reddit uh, was revenue was comprehended between the uh, between eleven thousand and twenty five thousand asses uh, were definitely um, the most numerous class. Mm. Um, and probably relatively to this, we have to think that they, they weren't probably necessarily um, mobilized. Uh, in the sense that really the, the bulk of the armies, uh, of the Latin armies at this time, was really made up by the, um, the, the mm, let's say, um, of, of infantry, uh, of, of melee uh, infantry, practically. Um, so these guys instead were equipped just with um, they were uh, they they provided 30 uh, centuries and uh, they were made up by 30 centuries and they had to 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 participate to the army uh, being equipped just with slings and 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 throwing stones so uh, this uh, and, and these troops uh, were really mm, they could be useful because definitely they could be used in order to skirmish to to, to these preparatory phases between the clash between the two um, phalanxes let's say um, but they, they didn't make up a, um, a a solid rank they they simply wander around the formation throwing uh, sling uh, throwing stones with their slings and all um, so the fact that we're also the more numerous um, quantitatively in terms of mm, eligible mm, um, uh, fighters in the army doesn't mean that they were called up all uh, in in practice. Probably some of them also um, had uh, also other tasks of kind of helping. I don't know um, in the logistical service. Um, or helping the other guys, I don't know, to, to wear armor or to, I don't know, I, I'm just guessing something like that. But the idea is that even if probably the Romans could record tons of these guys, probably their number was limited because tactically speaking, they, they had a, 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 um, a relative importance, uh, and especially in logistical terms, um, they, you know, there were still people eating, needing to eat, to drink, and all. So, um, overinflating the numbers of an army can be also a logistical problem. If um, eventually, uh, uh, from a tactical point of view, these these guys do not make a, a, a great match, if not throwing stones. Um, so, also the the quantities here have to be understood with a kind of military um, logics. Uh, and uh, to the citizens, uh, to the centuries of um, of the fifth class, were also attached to um, two uh, more centuries of um, uh, of horn and tube uh, players that were the guys that basically uh, gave um, uh, you know sound uh, sounded the uh, the various uh, the various orders that were given to the army. So. Uh, they were uh, sort of an accessory role also here not practically fighting if not in uh, emergency conditions we can't think um, and really the, the, the citizens instead we had um, a lower revenue than the uh, 11,000 asses uh, Dionysius actually uh, this is actually uh, to according to, to what Levy is saying Dionysius says that uh, the the revenue had to be inferior to twelve um, thousand five hundred, but whatever. Uh, were the so-called uh, capite uh, kensi or ad kensi? Mm -hmm. So th th were those who were sensed only as um, as people practically, and not in uh, on the base of their revenue. Um, and even if they weren't really, um, dem dem even if they were demographically a consistent force in, in the city, um, they um, they made up a, a, a unique century. So even in terms of voting rights, they didn't count anything. And they, however, were exempted for mil from military service. 
uh, if not in cases of um, of of great uh, you know trouble for 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 the state, let's say, and in in such cases the um, the uh, the enrolling was uh, named as tumultus, mm? so it given gives the the, the tumultuous um, um, uh, picture of, of the of the situation in time of troubles, and these guys were um, organized uh, without weapons uh, at the service of the army, um, and used either to fill the gaps during the battles or maybe. Uh, doing other other things like uh, taking up the arms of the fallen or simply plundering because this is also what what happened usually you know in in, in all mm, armies in history that there was together with the the sold the troops there were loads of people who maybe followed even spontaneously just to to raid and to pillage if um, if there was such an, uh, an occasion to do so, um, and you understand that this ad had a very uh, had a very limited both political and military uh, importance eventually, um, uh, almost to to virtual in influence. Um, relatively to the cavalry, because here we have. Um, uh, it is interesting uh, that in the Serbian reform, the, this uh, reform uh, practically affected exclusively the infantry, which, tel which tells you that compared to previous times, to which also pr probably cavalry had a uh, great importance given the numbers that we see, and that probably still had in certain measure, um, the um, the uh, the commoners' classes were definitely expanding um, very widely, so and, and they they weren't uh, wealthy enough, nor um, they they didn't care evidently uh, about warfare excessively much to own an, an uh, to or a horse a war horse, um, and therefore the uh, the military service in this sense was aimed at creating uh, a solid mm, a robust uh, block of of infantry. Mm -hmm that definitely at the time in Europe was the strongest uh, arm. Mm. Uh, it's just between the, say, in, in the full Middle Ages that cavalry rises to, to the tactical primacy on the battlefield. Uh, at this time it was normal for infantry to be the dominating arm, tactically speaking. Uh, and the cavalry um, was um, instead made up, the Roman cavalry was made up um, by the patrician nobility um, uh, on the base of 18 uh, centuries. Mm -hmm. So this is more, more or less the picture. Uh, so what can we say about more about this reform? So first of all, it is evident then in the um, into the century eight assemblies, the Comitia Centuriata, the power was concentrated in the hands of the mm, of the wealthier classes. Mm. Uh, so if you count the vote of the knights uh, and uh, and of the first class, so eighteen centuries pl plus other eighty centuries. Um, this was um, uh, enough to uh, ensure the the absolute majority of votes uh, among the 193 centuries. So basically, the guys at the top were still commanding in Rome, mm. and um, this is uh, the Serbian army. Therefore, was primarily based uh, on the uh, weight and precision of infantry, definitely. Uh, and the um, the magister populi, eventually called dictator, um, was um, which was named by the consuls in case of necessity, was um, um, proposed to the magister equitum, so the mass of, of of knights, that was the commander of of cavalry. Um, so the um, the this what what practically uh, what did practically the the Serbian reform uh, uh, did it, it basically had established that only who could allow um, could provide their own equipment the so-called local pletes, 
uh, could be part of the army and to enjoy, therefore, of all the uh, political rights. Uh, uh, which in one word um, to be part of the populus romanus of the Roman people. This is the moment in which the Roman people is officially born as a political body. Mm? So SPQR Senatus Populusque Romanus it, and the, the populus romanus is born with this uh, with this reform and uh, on a political and military base. Mm -hmm. um, so those who owned nothing instead, so the so-called proletari, uh, that is those who were only capable of generating um, children uh, 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 and, and owning them because by the way uh, at this time the Roman uh, the Roman society, family was, uh, you know, with the pater familias at the top, and then um, having actually um, a right of, of of life and death on his wife and children as well. So the 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 children were were actually uh, um, uh, uh, was actually uh, uh, meant uh, to 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 be a sort of of property <laughs> in itself. So that that's that's uh, um, the meaning proper. Um, 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 were um, so uh, we we're saying those without property weren't uh, demanded to to arm mm -hmm. uh, because simply they couldn't find <laughs> the, uh, the military equipment. The military equipment wasn't an indifferent. Um, uh, expense definitely. I mean, in later times, especially with the second century BC crisis of recruitment, uh, that would become uh, more evident. Also, because the um, you know a lot of things had changed. The equipment was also increasingly costly from from a certain point of view, at least for the average legionnaire. Um, but definitely also at this time there were lots of people who could not have, I mean we're, we're still talking about primitive societies in some form. The, the, the Rome was wealthy for Italic standards, but for Italic standards in fact it wasn't an extremely wealthy place. And, and definitely as always uh, in, in societies there are people who were extremely poor, especially in pre-industrial times. Um, where material wealth is something that you have to build on your own. I mean, definitely having, and where the the the, the economy is mostly based on survival rates, um, finding the equip the um, the equipment for 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 going to war is something extremely expensive. Although uh, we must say that with the Serbian reform, we noticed that the Romans could were fairly well off for for um, you know for even conceiving this. Of this new um, order, and uh, th they could definitely, on average, uh, th they had a functional army of people who provided th their own equipment, so they weren't definitely a, a, a poor, a very poor society. Um, uh, and, and and the sad thing about those without property, uh, about the proletari, is that they weren't considered part of the Roman people of the Populus Romanus. Um, although, and this is very important from a political point of view, in the moment in which, I mean, there was no sectorism in this, because as long as the proletarius eventually became, mm, uh, you know, wealthy enough, he could enter to be part of the mm, uh, political and military body. So. There was no uh, classism. Um, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me. There was no. Um, um, uh, the, the, this this order was classist, but it wasn't uh, a caste essentially. Uh, anyone had the chance to 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 enter to 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 make part of the uh, of the upper classes if he was wealthy enough which reflects the, the very inclusive nature of Roman society uh, already um, at these initial stages um, uh, and, and, and could obtain the same political rights. Mm. Uh, 
so it was a pretty modern um, political institution. I mean, the Greeks had a completely different mindset in this uh, sense. Um, so the, the Roman city-state is born with uh, certain characters that really um, emphasized the uh, the chance of actually um, of making the city grow from a demographic point of view and definitely as a consequence from a political and military point of view. I mean the Roman armies that conquered the world were essentially made up most of the times of, of foreigners or people who however didn't have the or maybe they didn't have the full Roman citizenship and that's how the Roman armies actually um, didn't, out, uh, didn't run out of steam for, for centuries because they, they had always people who had the interest to serve into their army, so um, uh, into the Roman army. So this is really the interesting thing. Um, and definitely also the, at, at these very early stages, the Roman society, we have to think that it was born from quite different uh, ethnic groups were mentioning the Latins and the Sabines, the Etruscans, so the idea is that the Union makes force. Um, this is actually also part of the, the, the Roman political symbolism. Think about the um, the, uh, the, 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 the the bundle that eventually was taken by fascism because the, the, nom the name was actually Fascium. That there is this uh, bundle of, of 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 many sticks put together, and this this symbolism was actually the one that it meant that the more we are, the stronger we are. We can't be broken in practice, and this was really a very important char uh, mm, characteristics of, of Roman mm, politics that uh, mm, gave so much to Rome uh, in in an inclusive uh, in an inclusive sense. Um, the um so the mm, as we were saying at the beginning of the video it's it's pretty difficult actually to think that this r that the Serbian reform happened from day to an from a day to another um it it probably took really much time and even levy um, when talking about this, is actually mentioning the assets that was, um, uh, the, you know, the revenues meant from fr from a monetary uh, on a monetary base that is definitely anachronistic from 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 this time that actually was the the the, the beginning of the sixth century into which the Romans did, didn't use coins. Um, and there were other forms of payments. Uh, Roman society was still largely agrarian. Um, and um, and mo the money basically mm, was started to 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 be sp widespread in Rome only from the fourth century BC. So, um, according to what Gellius um, uh, says, the um, uh, the actual distinction that um, that that had been carried out for for a certain time uh, at least is that mm, simply between the the first class um, there was only essentially uh, one class the classes the, the first one that we have seen that in this sense was called class because it was initially even evidently the only one that was made up of the wealthy guys so um, and and then all the other citizens in practice that were called with the generic term of infra uh, class and so between essentially the the within the class and, and not really as the class and and therefore I in reality it seems logical that the uh, um, the uh, the classes proper could be made up also of the um, could could be the name mm, conceived for the the first cr uh, three classes in terms at least of, of equipment because we have seen that you know having a helmet a shield or a lance at least was essentially what made up the the uh, italic warrior at the time uh, so th there would 
th there was probably a very strong continuity with the aristocratic warfare of pre-Serbian times into the organization of the Serbian army itself. Um, the um, um, we can't go much farther, and I can't tell you that anyone was stressing that the Romans at this point were fighting their phalanx and that this um, classist criterion was based in order it w was created in order to achieve uh, uh, the the the, the recruitment of a, of a monopolitic phalanx is completely false because the Romans already fought in a similar fashion as all the other peoples in the sense that they were thickly compact formations like in any time practically uh, um, and they they definitely had certain uh, Hellenic style um, equipment but they didn't at all fight as hoplites in the sense in the in in the real sense of the world in the classical uh, Hellenic uh, oplitic uh, fashion um, and their ranks were much more disordered there was a much more individualistic attitude uh, th the idea of the w undisciplined warrior that had to achieve defeat as uh, as an individual fire was still pretty much there and would remain into the Roman army for a very long time and the Roman state struggled for centuries in order to, to frame this um, unruly, indisciplined uh, Italic uh, warriors into uh, a kind of ordered, uh, of an orderly fashion, let's say. Um, so there are certain... Um, um, there is a certain evidence. I mean, the, the question is, what did the Roman... Um, the Roman army look like on the, the the on the light of this um new Serbian um organization. I mean and there was evidently a, a social segmentation. Well there is a um a bronze vase from the sixth century that was found near the northern Italian city of Bologna, so close to actually the Etruscan uh, Italic wor uh, between the, the Etruscan Italic world in practice, that is normally um, considered a um, one of the few, actually, uh, if not the only one, uh, a depiction of an ancient um, Italic army, let's say, segmented with. Uh, essentially um, various types of, of fighters that are equipped in um, in a um, in, in seemingly into different fashions that theoretically have been thought to be corresponding to various classes um, we um, in this sense I'm, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical relatively to this because you know, there are uh, you can see certain knights, the presumably you know the main patricians for from a Roman perspective, um, that march um, uh, followed by um, four different types of warriors marching in column, uh, each one equipped with 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 their own uh, gear, different gear. That it that in this sense uh, has been thought to have been uh, differentiated according on the uh, social status practically. So relatively to this, uh, yes, uh, we we are pretty sure that um, in, in the Serbian army in Rome, as well as in in other parts of Italy, there was definitely a, um, a social segmentation. I mean, this is not nothing new. I mean, this happened everywhere in any other tribal society. The, the wealthy guys were the ones who who had uh, the better equipment, and uh, and and tell me where this didn't happen. Obviously, uh, the 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 vase here um, in Italian, I think it's called the Situla della Certosa, um, is is quite meaningful because it actually depicts um, a um, a pretty w what what really looks like a pretty orderly army. So it's not really um anything uh it, it's pretty eloquent that the older wanted to uh, 
probably to stress the the uh, really the difference in in the equipment of all these soldiers from in terms of a social segmentation. It's pretty much obvious, but uh, it's really a, a very few um, a, a, you know a very poor evidence, w generally speaking, of of this segmentation in the sense that, as we were saying, uh, the segmentation always existed in any army. Uh, this time, especially uh, if um, um, you know, you consider that uh, even it, this happens in in many other societies into which not necessarily the social segment. The I mean, the differentiation in equipment was so strict in terms of regulation. So uh, yeah, it, it's really interesting, but it's not a proof and it of something extremely um, uh, sharp in in, uh, in terms of, of division of the various uh, infantrymen uh, on the base of their uh, wealth and equipment um, and that's pretty much it I think it's a very long video yes one, uh, one hour and 15 <laughs> minutes it's fine but Okay, I mean, I hope you enjoyed it. I will definitely come back on these topics, don't worry, because the Serbian army, we I, I didn't actually even talk about that. Today we talk about the sensual differentiation um, of the Roman society after the reform. But we will talk more about the Serbian army in the future, so this is definitely not all. For now, I just hope that you enjoyed my video, and if you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or simply subscribe to my channel if you want to receive uh, news about uh, my new contents. And for now, I thank you heartfully for listening to me. As always, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye!